Welcome to CSHE Certified Healthcare Facility Manager Study Guide. In this section of the study guide, we will be reviewing the administration portion of the test. These topics are taken directly from the CHFM Candidate Handbook. Approximately 16 of the 100 questions on the exam will be on the area of administration, with three of these being the ability to recall or recognize specific information regarding administration and 10 questions being the ability to comprehend, relate, or apply knowledge to new or changing situations regarding administration. Three questions will be on the ability to analyze and synthesize information, determine solutions, and evaluate the usefulness of a solution as it pertains to administration. Taken directly from the CHFM Candidate Handbook, the first area we will be covering is on reviewing and revising existing policies and procedures. Policies are the principles of your facility, which must comply with medical ethics, government laws, and professional regulations. Policies are found in the facility's operations manual, in each department manual. A departmental policy must not conflict with an operational policy. If a conflict is found, then the operational policy takes precedence. Accreditation surveyors will ask to see your policies and procedures manuals to renew your facility's license. Policies usually deal with personnel concerns such as hours of work, benefits, overtime, vacation, sick leave and grievances, and incorporating company rules and quality standards into them. CMMS is a computerized maintenance management system. The CMMS contains detailed, descriptive, and visual instructions for maintenance tasks and may contain the items shown on the screen. The drawings support specific directions for exactly how a maintenance or repair task is to be performed. Next, we will be looking at allocating resources for capital improvement. Capital projects are given a priority ranking after a careful in-house review and are chosen on the basis of expected improvements in the cost of operation, changing needs, changes in policies and procedures, new technologies, equipment that needs to be replaced or updated, changes in rules, regulations, or standards from governmental or standards organizations, and finally, changes in business conditions. The Board of Directors deals with major issues arising from the in-house review and makes any final choices before approving the capital budget. Next, approving capital equipment pur purchases. The purchase of capital equipment should be justified and should fit into the organization's total program. Individual items may be grouped with others that are related to the same objective and together they are approved as one project. New equipment may be needed for maintaining the condition of the facility, updating aged equipment, a new program, a revision of regulations or standards, energy conservation efforts, environmental concerns, efforts to improve efficiency, and desired improvements in costs and labor. Next, developing a long-range capital improvement plan. A long-range improvement plan, also known as a long-range capital investment strategy, is a guide to facility construction and renovation over a period of five to 10 years, and should include the following. Help senior management understand the issues and priorities facing the organization. Should also help accountants and legal counsel keep the facility's investments in line with the strategic plan of the organization. It should also inform the employees and other stakeholders about the organization's long-range goals and priorities. And finally, it should allow for changes and adjustments because needs and conditions change and individual projects must be eliminated or re revamped. Next. Evaluating and justifying needs and purchases. 
Predictive maintenance means monitoring the condition of equipment to identify faults before they develop into major problems. Early identification of developing pro problems enables the maintenance staff to order parts as needed, rather than carrying unnecessary inventory. Repairs can be scheduled so as to minimize disruptions in service and sudden breakdowns can be avoided. Maintenance is timed before the machine loses performance and for when it is most cost effective. Next, evaluating capital equipment and system improvements. Value engineering, which is also known as value analysis or value control, is a widely accepted management tool for lowering cost by substituting equivalent materials that will do the same job without degrading the quality, lifespan, features, appearance, or use of a machine. The same requirements for quality, performance, reliability, and safety must be met. Value engineering is a systems-oriented approach with a life cycle orientation that relates value received to the functions and resources designated for a project. The value engineering assessment is performed by a team with experience in design, construction, and facility management. Next, we will be looking at managing labor distribution for projects and operations. The facility manager is responsible for the following. Allocating personnel, equipment, and materials for specific jobs at specific times. Scheduling work successfully by anticipating what needs to be done and when. Remaining flexible and allowing time for delays caused by weather, absent workers, unanticipated changes, and emergencies. Also, long-term scheduling is required for all pro large projects, which may span over a period of many years. Short-term scheduling is for projects that require at least 24 hours to complete. Engineered Performance Standards, or EPSs, requires the facility manager to calculate the allowed numbers of hours in which a qualified worker who has average skills and makes an average effort can produce a predetermined quantity of work. Information may come from the facility manager's observations and previous experience, from the manufacturer of equipment that is to be installed or maintained, or from an experienced trade person. The CHFM must have a precise and definitive description of the work to be done before trying to calculate engineered performance standards. The CHFM writes out in detail the exact repair or maintenance task, rather than using a catch-all phrase such as fix a leaky faucet. Follow this guideline for every EPS you calculate. First, identify the work location and state how to gain easy access. Next, specify the number and type of personnel required for you to complete the task. Next, indicate the time required to retrieve supplies and for any travel. Next, write the standards at an appropriate level for a professional tradesperson who is skilled, possesses the necessary tools, has access to the needed supplies and equipment, and who can present at the work location when the work is to be done. Next, managing actual expenditures to assure that departmental operations fall within budget. A purchase order is a legally binding contract between the hospital and the supplier, which authorizes the supplier to ship goods and guarantees that the hospital will pay the agreed upon price. The facility manager can only authorize purchases from approved suppliers. If an approved source does not already exist, the facility manager locates an appropriate supplier and gets it authorized by the purchasing manager. Authorized purchase orders should be used for all purchases, except when an emergency creates a threat to life or property. Allocated funds are money set aside for a specific purpose. Allocations may be made periodically, such as quarterly, so that the entire budget cannot be spent in the first few months of the year. 
Funds are committed when an order is placed. Once committed, the money cannot be shifted to another purpose without negotiation, arbitration, or legal action. When the check is written to pay for the order, the funds are expended. The facility manager controls the maintenance department budget by periodic reviews with an accountant and a senior administrator. Monthly budget reports should provide quick and easily understood information that should reflect the priorities of the maintenance department. Next, developing presentations on proposed projects. Often made at the executive level, such as the CEO or CFO, the CHFM must remember that the decision makers are not engineers and therefore must not use jargon in their presentations. Explain all technical terms using some of the following tools. Audiovisuals, handouts, flip charts, PowerPoint slides, or even mock-ups. Next, developing and providing equipment and systems training programs for maintenance staff. Large medical organizations have a training and development office, which is usually part of human resources. Orientation and sensitivity training is entrusted to training and development. However, training that is specific to a job or department should be done by the manager of that department because he or she is a subject matter expert, also known as an SME. The trainer needs to be thoroughly familiar with the job and must be able to observe and evaluate the performance of the employees. In the facility management area, the facility manager is responsible for technical training and performance appraisals. Next, providing for the ident identification and resolution of problems with delivery of services. The facility manager is responsible for ensuring the terms of a warranty or guarantee are f fulfilled by the following. Dealing with vendors, ensuring that delivery dates and other specifications of purchase contracts are met, carefully recording and keeping in order to lower the risk of a warranty being voided on the basis of poor maintenance, either using CMMS or keeping a tickler file to prompt you to schedule equipment maintenance on time. Note that this helps reduce the costs associated with a piece of equipment by ensuring it is serviced according to the terms of its warranty. Be sure to include the expiration date of the warranty on the CMMS or tickler card. Next, we will be looking at coordinating department activities with other departments, outside agencies, and contractors. The facility department offers support and maintenance services to the entire healthcare organization. So it is vital for the certified healthcare facility manager to communicate and cooperate with all departments. Other departments must keep the facility department informed about their needs for patient-related services, changes needed for heating and air conditioning, and problems with medical equipment. And in the reverse, the rest of the establishment must be informed when major repairs or maintenance activities are scheduled. Next, we will be looking at managing and overseeing operations of the following shown on the screen. Note that some of these are covered later in the presentation and may not be immediately covered. First, the plant. The facility manager coordinates all operations in the plant to ensure continuous supply of utilities to the hospital, including the following systems, potable water, steam, chilled water, electricity and emergency power, heating hot water, irrigation, medical gases, medical vacuum, compressed air, and sewer. 
When you identify a maintenance deficiency, generate a work order for corrective action. Prioritize the work order according to the severity of the problem. Cross-reference it as a quality control correction in a computerized suspense file, which is automatically updated when the task is completed. Identify the cause of the deficiency for the quality assurance manager. And then outline your corrective action so the cause will not engender a cycle of deficiencies and corrective measures. Also, track trends in deficiencies so that long-term corrective measures can be put in place. And finally, notify other applicable managers if necessary. A detailed engineering assessment is used to identify non-compliance with codes and other physical plant problems that can have a negative effect on the organization. An engineering assessment includes electrical, plumbing, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, fire safety, structural, and all other building systems. The engineering assessment should also take into consideration the age of the building, its functional layout, and wayfinding measures. Include any future plans for alterations or reconfigurations in the present assessment, since it is not uncommon for a physical structure to become obsolete for its current function, while still being physically usable. Many modern buildings have sealed windows to prevent heat loss. In medical facilities, windows are also sealed to protect patient and confidentiality and to prevent patient abductions or escape. Areas of buildings that open to greater than a single story drop should have a risk assessment completed for the area for suicide prevention. During a construction project, the facility manager is responsible for the following. Seeing that the work is completed properly, ensuring that plans are followed, that legal requirements are met, and that the work is done on time, and that the project stays within budget. Also, receiving the cert certificate of insurance and any bonds from the general contractor, and for ensuring that all required permits are on site at the beginning of the project. During the construction phase, the facility manager reports at least every other week to senior management concerning the project's progress, any problems that have occurred, the costs, including those for change orders. Also, securing from senior management any needed approvals, and finally, seeing that bills are paid by accounts payable or payroll when they are due. The facility manager is responsible for coordinating, testing per the local, state, and federal regulations and standards, preventive maintenance on all fire and life safety systems, ensuring repairs are made in a timely fashion, areas of the building are inspected on a regular basis, and that life safety drawings are up to date and available for inspectors and that hazardous storage areas and the fire smoke barriers associated with them are maintained in good working order. The design of a green building is intended to do the following. Protect the health of users, increase their comfort, improve worker productivity, use natural resources more efficiently than a conventional building, and reduce the overall environmental impact of the building. Some green building practices include the following. Making use of existing plants and features of the site, using recycled materials wherever possible, optimizing the use of natural light, and using alternative and renewable sources of energy. Also, note that recycling is important both as an ecological consideration and as a possible source of income to the hospital. Among the products a healthcare facility might recycle are paper, glass, aluminum cans and other metals, and also styrofoam and blue wrap and other plastic products. Under architecture and design, you will need to know about the wellness room, which is a recent concept in patient rooms. 
It is a modular design that incorporates proven therapies with patient satisfaction in mind to create a flexible, efficient, and comfortable room that is task-centered and of high quality. The comfort of the patient's family has to be taken into consideration into the design of the wellness room. For additional information on construction guidelines, please see the AIA guidelines. For safety management, management involves employees in the safety plan and programs by forming a safety committee whose members assume responsibility for the following. Establishing guidelines for safe conditions and behavior. Collecting employee input for use in establishing training programs for safety. Investigating accidents and categorizing them. Filing accident reports. Conducting safety inspections and evaluating the results. Initiating plans for the correction of safety problems. And conducting safety meetings. Facility managers must ensure the following streams of waste are properly handled according to local, state, and federal guidelines. Some of these include municipal solid waste, recyclables, biohazardous wastes, hazardous wastes, chemotherapy wastes, next, managing various human resource functions. Facility managers must comply with equal opportunity and affirmative action laws when advertising, screening, interviewing, and selecting new staff for the facility department. List job description and the requirements for education, licensure, and experience explicitly. Screening of applicants should cover reviewing the applications, verification of the data provided from the applicant, background checks, credit checks, and driving record checks, and also drug testing. Next, developing departmental strategic management plans. Strategic plans are the long-range plans that set the direction in which the company will move in the next several years. The plans for the facility department should fit well with the overall plans for the company. Strategic plans affect decisions concerning renovations versus new construction, the focus of investments, and customer services. Information for strategic planning comes from many sources, including the general policies and the business plan for the corporation, the planning done by the business units, and the history of the corporation. Issues that should be addressed by the strategic plan include capacity, relocation and expansion, life cycle costing, and capital budgets. Next, participating in selecting outside sources for needed services. When distributing RFPs or requests for proposals, facility managers can find sources at the following. Recommendations from other facility managers in your area. Facility managers you meet at conferences and professional organization meetings. Equipment manufacturers sometimes supply maintenance or repair for their own products at their service shops. Their services may be available on a contract basis or through an as-needed plan. Some engineering and construction businesses provide services, including emergency repairs. And finally, directories and printed and online telephone listings are other sources for the names and addresses of contractors to whom a facility manager might want to submit a request for a proposal. Next. Conducting staff in services on department policies and procedures. Even licensed employees need training in the details of the work they are expected to do 
and in the general policies and procedures of your organization. Some forms of training may include the following. When you update a procedure, hold an in-service training session. Also, before you put a new piece of equipment into service, schedule operations and maintenance training on the piece of equipment for all employees who will be involved with it. Also, inform new hires about the type of behavior your hospital expects. Discuss absences, accidents, benefits, and sexual harassment. In the healthcare field, many employees who do not work directly with patients or clients must still sometimes deal with them. Give your maintenance employees sensitivity training for these situations. Explain to your employees that training not only enables them to perform better in their current jobs, but can enable them to qualify for promotions. Next, establishing partnerships with utility companies, city and state inspectors, insurance companies, and local community stakeholders regarding functional activities. The group of stakeholders and partners are much more complex for a healthcare organization than for many other businesses. Some include patients, which this is, should probably be considered the most important of all of the stakeholders, families and friends, insurers and fiscal intermediaries provide the highest percentage of a HCO's revenue. Insurers include government programs such as Medicare and Medicaid, and employers. Regulatory and licensing agencies must be counted as exchange partners, as must quality improvement organizations. Note that these local agencies are your exchange partners. EMS, or fire, police, and ambulance, public health, utilities, and charity organizations. Next, Managing a process to prioritize proposed projects on an annual basis. Facility managers should evaluate programs based on factors or criteria that can ensure fair distribution of prioritization. A summary of the facility planning issues should be created, separated from the space and other deficiencies that should be factored into your decision. Planning issues include those shown on the screen, such as layout, scheduling, appearance, or code problems. And space issues can include some of these shown on the screen, including patient rooms, staff and support space, and food service. Next, overseeing the functionality of the healthcare facility safety programs including reviewing summaries of deficiencies, problems, failures, and user errors. A written safety plan is an effort to reduce accidents and create a safe work environment. In order for the plan to accomplish its purpose, it must be supported by management and the employees must be convinced of its worth. The safety plan should be part of employee training. Be sure to enforce safety policies and procedures consistently. And reward safe working behavior with positive reinforcement. Report accidents on a standardized form approved by employee health. And review the form with the safety officer before taking action to prevent more accidents of a similar nature. Next, participating in insurance inspections and claims. The Certified Healthcare Facility Manager is not expected to be an expert on insurance. However, the facility manager should be knowledgeable about the subject because he or she may be involved in selecting policies or filing claims for fire, fidelity, or liability insurance, or for co workers' compensation. Top-level management should review insurance purchases and approve them since there are serious drawbacks to both being overinsured and being underinsured. And finally, the facility manager may also be involved in any inspections or tours for insurance purposes.
Next, we will be going over some various study questions. Note that some of the questions may seem dated, but many of the topics are still covered in the facility manager exam, so individuals should familiarize themselves with the subjects. The Board of Directors of a healthcare facility selects capital projects based on which of the following? A, changes in government regulation, B, policies in the operations manual, C, predictive maintenance procedures, D, an engineering assessment. The best answer here is A. A change in governmental regulations is one of the basis for allocating funds for a capital project. Which of the following is not a responsibility of the safety committee? A, categorizing all accidents. B, collecting input from employees. C, filing claims for workers' compensation. Or D, evaluating the results of an inspection. Answer C is the best answer here. The facility manager, not the safety committee, is involved with filing claims for workers' compensation. Safety committee responsibilities do include investigating and categorizing accidents to see whether they were caused by system problems or employee behavior. Employee input is collected to help establish safety programs. Conducting safety inspections and evaluating the results is an important responsibility of the safety committee as well. When writing an EPS or Evaluation Performance Standard, the CHFM must A. Allow for delays caused by unanticipated changes. B. Collect and preserve maintenance information. C. Schedule operating and maintenance training. D. Describe standards at an appropriate level. D is the best answer here. An EPS should be written so that a tradesperson will easily be able to understand it and complete the work that needs to be done. Allowing for unanticipated changes, absent workers, and weather means the CHFM must be flexible when drawing up a schedule. Collecting and preserving maintenance and repair information is accomplished with the aid of a Computerized Maintenance Management System, or CMMS. And before putting a new piece of equipment into use, training should be scheduled for all personnel who will be using it. When do allocated funds become committed funds? Is it A, when the check is written to pay for the order? B, when the purchase order is written out? C, when the money is negotiated for another purpose? D, when the funds are reflected in the budget report? B is the correct answer here. A written purchase order that has been approved by the Certified Healthcare Facility Manager indicates that committed funds have been allocated. Which of the following does a long-range capital investment strategy not provide? A, help for senior management related to understanding priorities. B, information for employees about the facility's goals. C, periodic review of an accountant and senior administrators. D, help and direction for legal counsel and accountants. Answer C is the correct answer here. The maintenance department budget is reviewed by an accountant and has nothing to do with long range planning. Value engineering can be defined as A, a standard developed by the Department of Defense in the 1950s to deal with aging buildings. B, a tool for lowering costs by substituting equivalent materials that can do the same job. C, a PowerPoint presentation to illustrate engineering proposals for a new facility. D, an assessment of electrical, plumbing, HVAC, structural, and fire safety systems. Answer B is the correct answer here. 
Value engineering was developed by General Electric during World War, II, World War II when not enough traditional materials could be found to complete the assembly of B-24 bombers and other materials were substituted, resulting in lower costs. The Department of Defense developed EPS, or Engineered Performance Standards, in the 1950s to help with efforts to maintain war-damaged older buildings. PowerPoint is software designed to help individuals make presentations to an audience, and an engineering assessment is used to identify problems in facility systems, such as HVAC. A CMMS, or Computer Maintenance Management System, contains which of the following? A, engineering assessments related to code and compliance. B, information about service contractors. C, estimates of capital equipment expenses. D, parts lists and diagrams from the manual. D is the correct answer here. A CMMS contains information that has been scanned from various manuals, such as parts lists. Predictive maintenance involves A, monitoring equipment to identify developing problems, B, controlling the maintenance department's budget, C, ensuring the terms of a warranty are fulfilled, D, using the internet to disseminate medical information, Answer A is the correct answer here. Predictive maintenance, also called condition-based maintenance, involves monitoring equipment to identify developing problems. The most appropriate time for equipment training programs for both maintenance staff and user groups is A, in preparation for determining whether the equipment is appropriate for the facility, B, when the equipment is failing due to user error. C, when complaints about function become apparent. Or D, when the equipment is about to be placed in service. Answer D is the best answer here. Training concurrent with equipment startup and use is a proactive and efficient approach and should you be used. So D is the best answer here. A facility is installing an air intake for a medical air compressor. What is the minimum height in feet at which this should be located above the ground? Is it A, 5, B, 10, C, 20, D, 30? C is the correct answer here because 20 feet is the minimum distance required by NFPA 99. How many FTEs are needed to staff one position 24 hours a day, seven days a week? A, four, B, 4.2, C, 4.3, D, 4.4. Answer B is the correct answer here, because 24 hours times 7 days a week equals 168 hours total. Take the 168 and divide it by 40, which is the amount of hours that a person works, gives you the answer of B, or 4.2. Which of the following Joint Commission standards requires a facility manager to provide for ongoing education and training to improve and maintain staff competence? A, environment of care, B, human resources, C, leadership, and D, performance improvement. Answer B is the correct answer here. This requirement is clearly delineated in the Human Resources section. When should routine maintenance and operational testing for emergency generators start? A, at the end of the warranty period. B, immediately after acceptance tests. 
C, 30 days after acceptance tests, or D, 90 days after acceptance tests? Answer B is the correct answer here, because according to NFPA 110, operational testing shall start immediately after acceptance tests are complete. Which of the following are elements of a capital budget? One, salaries for new employees. Two, new MRI equipment. Three, new four-floor patient bed wing project. Or four, chiller replacement. And they are looking for three out of four correct answers. Answer D is the correct response here because answers two, three, and four are all true. Answer one is false because salaries are typically part of an operations budget. Which of the following are tracked in payroll as non-productive time? One, meeting time. Two, sick time. Three, break time. Four, holiday time and they are looking for two out of four true answers. Answer D is the correct response here, because answers two and four are both true. Sick time and holiday time is considered non-productive time. Examples of ongoing performance improvement monitoring include one, monthly generator runs. Two, the number of staff members completing the required safety training. C, the completion of fire drills. And four, unexpected equipment failures. And they are looking for two out of four true answers. Answer D is the correct response here, because answers two, and four are both true. Answer two is true because it is an acceptable performance improvement monitor. And number four is true because it is also an acceptable performance improvement monitor. Answer one is false because monthly generator runs is a requirement and cannot be an improvement monitor. And answer three is false because the completion of fire drills is also a requirement and cannot be an improvement monitor. A facility has a capital budget of $12 million. An MRI machine costs $2.5 million. An X-ray machine costs $500,000. And cryogens have an average monthly cost of $5,000. What percent of the capital budget will be spent on radiology equipment? Is it A, 24%, B, 24.5%, C, 25%, or D, 25.5%? Answer C is the correct answer here. First, you take the $2.5 million and you add it to the $500,000 to get a total of $3 million. Next, you take the $3 million and divide it by the total of $12 million, which gives you 0.25. Converted to percentage is 25%. Note that the cost of cryogens is an operating expense and is not a capital budget expense and should not be used in the equation. Which of the following determine required staffing levels for a facility power plant? One, dollars budgeted for staffing. Two, hours of operation. Three, state and local codes. Four, benchmark data. and they are looking for two of four true answers. Answer C is the correct response here, because answers two and three are, also, are both correct. The hours of operation with state and local codes determine the staffing levels. Answer one is false because dollars budgeted will be driven by the requirements of the code. 
and answer four is false because benchmarking of services is useful, but it is unrelated and independent of any requirements. A maintenance and operations department has a budget of 10 FTEs. The total hours worked for the last two week pay period are listed on the screen. How many FTEs were paid this pay period? Answer D is the correct answer here. And the equation for how to calculate it is shown on the screen. So the correct answer is a total of 13 FTEs for the pay period. According to the NFPA, fire drills in healthcare facilities shall be conducted A, monthly on each shift, B, quarterly on each shift, C, semi-annually on the day shift and quarterly on other shifts, D, annually on each shift. Answer B is the correct answer here, because according to NFPA 19, this is the interval at which drills shall be conducted. It is permitted to make a code announcement rather than using an audible alarm while conducting a fire drill between what hours of operation? A, 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. B, 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. And C, 9 p.m. and 7 a.m. D, 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. Answer B is the correct answer here, because according to NFPA 101, this is permitted. When reviewing a capital equipment request, the facility manager's first concerns are 1. Cost, 2. Electrical, 3. Location, or 4. Mechanical, and they are looking for 3 out of 4 true answers. Answer D is the correct response here, because answers 2, 3, and 4 are all correct. Answer 1 is false, because while the cost of equ capital equipment is important, it should not be the first consideration for the facility, for the facility manager. A facility has two full 32-gallon trash collection receptacles. Which of the following areas is the appropriate location for storage of these receptacles? A, food handling, B, hazardous, C, engineering space, or D, housekeeping closet? Answer B is the best answer here, because according to NFPA 101, a facility may exceed the 32 gallon limit in a hazardous area. Maintenance has to complete 160 hours of work in one week. If two engineers are 0.8 FTEs, one engineer is a 0.5 FTE, and one engineer is a 1.0 FTE, how much overtime will have to be worked? A, 26 hours, B, 36 hours, C, 46 hours, D, 56 hours. Answer B is the correct answer here, because you take 0 0.8 multiplied by 2 to give you 1.6 FTEs, which is added to the 0.5 FTEs and the 1 FTE to give you a total of 3.1 FTEs. You then take that 3.1 FTEs and multiply it by the 40 hours that they can work, which equals 124 hours. You subtract 124 hours from the 160 hours to get a total of 36 hours. This completes the administration section of CSHE's Certified Healthcare Facility Manager 
study guide. 